Good evening and a very warm welcome to our third Wednesday webinar of 2021. You are kindly joining us by Zoom and you're really welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. And I'm delighted to be joined by Sir Mark Todd and Pippa Funnel. Uh, tonight's topic is getting our horses fit for the season ahead. Um, you're joining us by Zoom, so when we do get onto the Q&As, then please do use the Q&A function rather than the chat, chat function, although if you want to talk to, to each other, then you can always use the chat function. We're just marking time slightly while we wait for our Facebook live audience to join us, and I hope that you've had a chance to go and see the previous Wednesday webinars that we've been running. Pippa, joined us back in fact it was our very first uh, Wednesday webinar back in mid-June and and Mark joined us back in December so please don't do go and look at our previous web, uh, webinars which are up on our YouTube channel and a very warm welcome also to those who are joining us by Facebook live for our third Wednesday webinar of 2021. Uh, the tonight's topic is on getting our horses ready for the season ahead and I am delighted to be joined by Sir Mark Todd and Pippa Funnel M MBE, who clearly no, need no introduction and dominated their sport of eventing for many decades. The format of tonight is going to be slightly different to how we do it normally. It's going to be far more conversational. We've got three sections that we're going to run through and then we're going to open it up to Q&A. So please do, if you are joining us by Zoom, then use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen rather than the chat function. And if you're joining us by Facebook Live, then please do use the comments function. And this is supposed to be interactive. So if you're joining us by uh, Facebook, then please do share the live video. And as I say, when we get onto the Q&A, please do get really engaged. Now, we've run a series of this since last June, and we're looking to run a, more, more webinars over the course of 2021. So if there's particular topics that you would like us to focus on, then please do um, send those in to education at worldhorsewelfare.org. Now, the next Wednesday webinar is going to be in a fortnight's time, and that's going to be on equine first aid on March the 3rd. And we'll place a, uh, a link in the chat function uh, shortly so you can sign up for that one. Now, before we start, I'm going to, in theory, I'm going to um, share my screen. Um, so I'm going to share it. Hang on. Sorry about that. Um, we will go back and we're going to start with a quick poll question. And the poll question, just to get a feel for who's joining us tonight. Um, I hope that's come through. Um, and we'll go to a uh, start that there. You would have thought. So at what level do you usually compete? And we've given you a, a number of different uh, options there from affiliated British eventing to, to some people who, who don't compete. And it's just we just want to get a feel for for Mark and, and Pip where you are. And whilst you're answering that question, I, we, I, I'll just tell you a little bit about World Source Welfare. Uh, which is a charity founded in 1927, very much to support the hum horse-human partnership. We work across the world, as you see on the map, but at our heart, it is about supporting the horse-human partnership. And of course, there's nowhere that's more relevant than in, in sport. And World Horse Welfare has long time supported the responsible use of horses in sport and is welfare advisors to International Equestrian Federation, the FEI, the British Horse Racing Authority, and has advised a number of national federations across the world. So tonight's webinar is all about uh, getting our horses uh, ready for the season ahead. And we're going to divide it up to three sections, how to get your horses fit, common mistakes and how to avoid them, and then the importance of good equine welfare. So we'll, we'll focus a, a discussion around those with, with Mark and Pip, and then we will open it up to Q&A. So please do, at that stage, get involved in it. And I'm delighted therefore to introduce our two panelists who I say need no introduction. Between them they have over seven decades of experience in eventing. Uh, Mark's first sort of shot to prominence in, in the UK when he won badminton back in 1980 on Southern Comfort III. Many of you might not know that his groom that day was Andrew 
Nicholson and Andrew uh, obviously Mark went on to to dominate the sport of eventing for so so many years uh, to, which prompted Andrew to say that Mark could ride anything he could even get a cross country he could even go around cross country on a dairy cow I'm not sure he's ever done that but of course he's had so many wonderful horses and charisma the horse that took him to double Olympic gold um, in 1984 and 1988 obviously one of the best of them um, and then Pippa, who, um, whose first pony was, according to her, uh, her interview with Pony Magazine, was a little black hairy pony called Pepsi Cola, who could do a little bit of everything. Um, and uh, I loved in, in Pippa's interview of that, she, the best piece of horsey advice was that 95% of a horse's problems is what the rider is doing on top, how true that is. But of course, Pippa's so well known for being the first ever Ever, um, a winner of the Rolex Grand Slam, having won Kentucky, uh, Badminton and uh, Burley in the same year. So I am delighted to have Pippa and Mark with us tonight. And before we get going, um, um, uh, Basil, can you give us the answer of the quiz? There we go. We've got um, um, uh, over a third who are affiliated British eventing um, and um, about a third who are doing unaffiliated competition and a smattering of the rest. So there you go. Um, that is, it's wonderful to have you all with us. And, and Mark and Pippa, a very good evening to you. How are you doing? Good evening. Yeah, good, e good evening. Good evening. Brilliant. Well, listen, we're, we're going to keep this relaxed. I know you're both drinking water, so um, and you want something stronger to drink. Um, <laughs> so the first bit, well, we'll just how to get our horses fit to compete. Now, of course, we live in a, a slightly strange world at the moment in terms of living under restrictions. But uh, Pip, if I come to you first, um, a suitable training programme for someone who's um, looking to set out on a B80 this year. What, what, what uh, sort of first thoughts would you have? Well, I think um, for sure fitness isn't something that can be done in a hurry. It has to be done over several months. It's not something you can suddenly do within a week. It's a slow build up building that sort of foundation to the basic fitness if and it depends at what point you start at for instance my horses start from old-fashioned way of being out in the field or you know for a long time over the winter so it's a slow build up over several months um i would say for b80 and 90 i would compare that with my young horses that are coming into the sport, a five or a six year old. Um, so refitness for that, I would say, again, every horse is individual. So you have to go a little bit on the type of horse, whether it's got thoroughbred in it or whether it's something a little bit chunkier and, and, and a bit more of a half breed. But I would say that for that level, I think just the nature of the sport, if you're regularly training for all three disciplines I don't think you need to be going regularly to the gallops at all you know I think the the basic training covering the dressage covering the the um show jumping and the cross country should should be enough you know that gradual build up um and for sure with the cross country schooling that will give them a bit of fitness anyway so I'm personally a big believer in in spending as much time out of the school believe it or not so I'm a real believer in hacking but again that depends completely on people's situation at their own homes whether they've got safe hacking or not Brilliant. Um, thank you. But Mark, obviously, having got into the world of you've had a couple of stints as a, a racehorse trainer does that make you think differently about how someone should prepare for to, for, for an eventing season? No, I mean, basically, we start off the racehorse is pretty similar to um, starting off an event horse. But you've got to remember in racing, we might be de dealing with like two or three year olds. So, um, you know, you can't be hammering them too much. But, you know, as, as Pip said, you know, I think we always used to start ours off if they'd come in from the field by doing road work um, and gradually building that up before they before they went into the school and started doing schooling. But if if you're doing 80, 90, it's not a huge level of fitness that is required, but they need to be built up and get their muscles fit even to do the sort of basic dressage and show jumping and cross country. So you need to be, as Pip said, practicing 
those sort of things um, in your build up for the competition. But the problem at the moment is <clears throat> not knowing when that competition is going to start. But the bonus is that, um, you know, it gives you more time to train and get ready. Brilliant. Yeah. So, Mark, what do you think in terms of someone who's setting out, what facilities do you think someone needs uh, to be able to get their horse fit enough to do a B80? Well, when I first came to England, my facilities um, were a field and stable, and that was it. I didn't have an arena. I didn't have gallops. I didn't have anything. But um, we were lucky enough... <coughs> We were close to a quiet road, so you could um, we could go hacking to get fitness uh, into the horses. We we're also quite close to some hills. And I think hills, if you've got access to hills, it's a brilliant way to get horses fit, um, even just walking or trotting up hills. Um, nowadays, with the roads the way they are, you know, if, if you're having to, to work on roads, it can be quite tricky if, if you're in a busy area. I mean, again, where we are, we're quite lucky. We can get up on the Ridgeway and we're completely away from traffic. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what facilities do you need? I mean, you you, talk, you, you had a stable and a field. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like you can make do. If you've got one horse, you know, you don't have to have an arena. If, if you've got if you're lucky enough to have fairly dry dry land and, and not too hard, you can you can do it from the field. You can uh, most people have a horse box that they can box to go somewhere to work in an arena or whatever, or you can make an arena on the grass. Um, you might only have a few um, oil drums and a couple of bits of four by two to make jumps, but you know you can. There's, there's if you're creative, you can you can make do with very little. I mean, obviously, if you're fortunate enough, you have an arena, you have jumps and you have access to, to good hacking and, and you have access to cross-country schooling and that, it makes life probably a little bit easier, but it's not totally necessary. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, Pip, from your perspective, I mean, the importance of road work would, would obviously resonate. I mean, but if you can't use, if you can't get out to, to, on the roads, what, what would you suggest? Well, yes, I completely agree. I mean, exactly what Mark was saying, but I remember going back a very long time ago before I served my apprenticeship, um, a year apprenticeship when I was doing Pony Club and when I very, very first started eventing, I, I made, I used to do a lot of the canter work along, along the side of country lanes on verges and I used, and I remember I was really naughty because I pinched a few bollards from the roads and I used to, uh, <laughs> I don't suggest people go around pinching bollards but and, and and literally in a very small area and that was my arena and that's how I train but I'm I, I think it's amazing even you know yes we're lucky I'm in a situation now I've got super jumps I've got super facilities but but it's amazing what you can do just with two poles yeah. you know and 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 a small area so it's about the quality and you can still work whatever your situation you can work in a you can work on yourself you, you, you know for instance during that this terrible weather we've had I did so much just in a little tiny lunch pen because that was the only thing that we kept going and it was amazing I how varied and I how I used my head from I I drove the horses I lunged the horses I rode without stirrups I had a stick behind my back I did pole work with them another day I did a bit of loose jumping another day so and that was just in such a small little area so so I think people just have to make use of, of what they've got and what situation they're in. Um, but I am, I'm very lucky because I've got fantastic hills and because of the hills, I have probably would say I do half the amount of fast work that most other event riders do because our hills are fantastic. Mark, compared to, you know, obviously in previous times, but I mean, climate change is becoming a factor. You know, we um, especially God, the, the wetness of this winter is it, it had us all depressed. I mean, what, what, what kind of challenges does that create in terms of getting our horses fit? Um, well, again, I mean, if, if you're lucky enough to have all weather surfaces, then it, 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 it doesn't matter, although our all weather gallop it, it got a bit wet and then it froze so it was about and our and our and our outdoor school froze as well so um you know 
and, and in fact, the only part that we could ride on safely was, was the field, which had a good covering of grass and, and uh, we could ride on that. So, um, you know, if, if you've got access to safe roads, you can always go on the road, providing it's not frozen up and, and dangerous. Um, so, you know, you've, like Pippa said, you've just, got to, you've just got to be a little bit inventive and, yeah. and, and use, use your head and use what you've got available. And Pip in the summer, sorry, in the summer, you know, the, the biggest problem is the ground gets so hard now. And um, so, you know, you, you, that, that can be a big problem with, with horses and getting horses fit if you've only got hard ground to work on because it can um, jar them up, wear and tear on the joints and that sort of thing. Yeah. And then I suppose but you've, you've already talked about, you know, the, the current sort of COVID restrictions, you know, for, for people, some people, you know, after last March would have turned their horses out and, and given them a, a, a season off, um, which is often no bad thing. You know, so, so a horse that has had an extended period of time off, what, what, what advice would you give to bringing them back into work and getting them fit? Well, again, I think... Um, you know, you've got you've got two options because of the uncertainty of COVID at the moment. And there's no at the moment, we don't know when the competitions are going to start up. So you look at it in two, to, to me, you look at it in two views. Firstly, you either look at it with the view, right, OK, I'm going to plan that the season is going to start. We know it's not going to start in March. So let's say earliest it's going to start in April. So I myself am having my horses fit and ready so bang when that day comes I know the horses are fit enough they've done all the work because it's much easier to get your horses fit and once they get to a level of fitness they don't lose it suddenly they don't lose it over two weeks you know then you can just keep them ticking over so I think it's more important from my point of view to get ahead of the game so that I know when D-Day comes and we're, we're told we can go, then the horses are ready to go. That's your first option. Otherwise, you think, right, I'm going to wait until the day comes. If you haven't put, you know, if you don't want to get, if, if you don't want to put the work in, not knowing whether it's going to be April, May, June, when we start up, if, if, if you're prepared to wait, then I think it's a situation you've got to be aware that if they start, say, April, if your horse isn't ready, then you've got to think, actually, I've got to wait a month, six weeks before I actually realistically start, even though the competitions might start before I'm ready. So that, to me, there are two options. But the option I'm taking, obviously, um, for my level, because uh, I've got horses aiming for badminton, which at the moment is very much going on behind closed doors. So to me, I am having, you know, I'm being ahead of the game. The horses had an easy year last year. So normally I would get them up um, they, after a, a t spell. They, they normally have a sort of between eight and 10, 11 weeks out in the field in the winter time. And they, I would normally get them up um, sort of beginning of December, sometimes some of them in the middle of December, whereas this year, because they had an easier year last year, they came up actually uh, the last week in in November so they were two weeks they're two weeks in front of what they normally would be sure I, th I think a lot of people who are competing at the lower levels they uh, they ride for pleasure so they they're probably riding and doing a bit with their horses and, and keeping them at a certain certain level anyway but you know what as Pip said what you don't want to do is sort of have your horse out in the field and then the, you know the events start up in April and say oh right next week I want to go to a competition and that's just not fair on the horse yeah Mark we talked a lot about then about equine fitness what did you do as a rider to get yourself fit and how important was rider fitness in in terms of the combination well when I first started off and when I was young I didn't think I needed to do anything for us <laughs> just just riding and the body seemed to stay fit. But as I got older, I needed to do a bit more. Um, so I actually took up yoga quite a few years ago. And I found, because riding is not really about strength, it's about suppleness and being able to use your body and, and, and be part of the horse. And, and I found with doing yoga, uh, I, it's, it's very good at um, giving you core strength and flexibility and 
it's also very good on 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 your mind as well and keeping you relaxed and so for me that was um, one way i personally although i used to be quite a good athlete i hate running i don't do it for fun so running was never an option i, I don't mind biking and i think that's quite um good good exercise i also <coughs> Um, a few years ago, bought a rowing machine, which has um, got some use. <laughs> <laughs> Not an awful lot, but I mean that's that's another good. Idea. But I think definitely, if you if you're only if you only got one horse or two horses, you you need to do something. I mean, so often you see. People, you know, trying to work their horses, not not a not cross country, but even on the flat, and they are not fit themselves. Yeah. You're not fit yourself. You can't expect to be able to ride your horse and, and expect your horse to go in a, in a proper way. So if you're working on getting your horse fit and getting your horse more supple, do at least the same amount with yourself and, and get yourself fit to do the job too. Brilliant. And now, Pip, I know you, you do Pilates, don't you? I, ha I would completely agree with Toddy and the work. You know, when I was younger, I did I did very little personal fitness. Um, just the horses kept me fit enough, but I've done more and more as I've got older, <laughs> as much as anything. You know, when you get from the falls and the wear and tear of the, the sport, you, you get out of bed and you sort of, or I, I certainly feel a lot older than what I am first thing in the morning and last thing at night. And, and so it's, I yes, I do a lot of Pilates. I'm a real believer in, in anything that helps the core strength um i have to say because i've got i think a very nice team of horses this year um and all sort of at the top end of the sport so i know i have got to be very very fit so for the first time in my whole of my life i am actually running i'm running every other day and then i do a strengthening circuit alternate I days watch that <laughs> But having said this, I've got this, there's this bloody pheasant because they're not shooting. There's this bloody pheasant that keeps on chasing me. And the other day, it pecked, my, pecked the back of my leg as I was having a little breather because the hill was so steep. I was trying to run up, and then this pheasant pecked me, and I had to, I was so shocked I'd start running again. But um, the whole idea, isn't it? Well, that's exactly what the pheasant wanted to do. <laughs> well, I, I don't, don't know. It should, it should have been that, shot. Don't don't you think, Pip, that like. The, the sport has become so professional now. If, if you're doing it at a professional level, that like even the young ones are doing doing stuff now to get themselves fit. And 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 even like, you know, it used to be a bit of a joke with the show jumpers, some of the old show jumpers, you know, they certainly weren't fit. But all the young show jumpers now at, at top level are all do um, some something, some other physical exercise to get themselves in shape. And if you want to be competitive at the top, you, you've got to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah, and it only helps, as, as Mark said, it, the fitter we are, the, the more it helps the horses. And that's exactly, to me, by working on your core, you know, you, you, you see people when you're teaching them and, and you can see a 10 stone girl riding around, but she rides like she's 14 stone or, you, they, you know, that you can see a guy who's 16 stone who rides light and actually rides like a, tends to you know how you're sat sat on a horse and the way you ride you can you you know you either ride heavy or you ride light mm -hmm. to me if you work on your core strength then you ride light you know you, you naturally ride lighter and Does that I make sense, buddy? <laughs> yeah no i mean i i can honestly say that i remember a couple of years ago a few years ago now at badminton i, I rode um leonidas and he nearly tipped me out at the double of sunken brushes or something and I know if I hadn't been doing my yoga and, and work on core strength, I wouldn't have been able to stay on. And it was purely because of that that I was able to stay on and carry on. That's so it's it's so important. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose Pip, to come back to your thing about you know ninety five percent of a horse's problem is is the rider on top. And actually, if you're fit, you're you're you're, you're going to provide a lot less problems to your horse. Um, um, and, and actually help yours as opposed to hinder it. Yeah, and also the other thing that I think is is that I've worked a lot with recently, I, I actually do, the, there are certain times of the year mm. that I, re, I do suffer from pollen and sort of with the breathing, with re, 
the, the tree and grass pollen. And something I've become very aware of, which has helped enormously is actually, and hopefully it might help people to, to hear this, because I think sometimes I can get breathless because I actually, particularly when you're going cross country, you sometimes forget to breathe. And I think it's something that I've worked on a lot that particularly some of these bigger courses through the anxiety or the nerves and the pressure, whether you go in to jump around a show dumping or cross country, we tend to sort of either hold our breath or we breathe from the top rather than from, and what I've become very aware of on a daily basis now that I actually go through phases when I really do think about working on my breathing because it's amazing. And I thought of that when I, when I rode around Burley on, um, a couple of years ago, that the long gallops in between, I actually made myself aware of my breathing. And I think that really helped um, the fit, you know, the fitness side, because you were getting oxygen into your lungs. And I think it's easy with, with nerves and, and, and anxiety or whatever the sport that we forget to breathe. The yo yoga is all about the breath as well. Oh, you see, I should have done yoga. I only do Pilates. <laughs> but it is. I mean, I can remember, you know, when you get nervous and even doing a dressage test, and you come out and suddenly you realise you haven't you haven't taken a breath, and you wonder why. <gasps> you yeah. Well, I remember my riding instructor it made me count to ten because if you're talking, if you shout, if you have to speak out loud, you have to breathe, and uh, that's the way of. Uh, you're you're a current Burley champion, aren't you? On MGH Grafton Street, aren't you, Pippa? Because they didn't have Burley last year, so. You no, I didn't have Burley, but it's, it was gutting because, well, yeah, you see, I was all set and ready to go to Kentucky last year and win that, and then badminton and win that. And like, it's, it's so annoying because I just missed <laughs> out. <laughs> so, no, um, he's a good form. They all had a good jump yesterday, but um, right. let's, you know, fingers crossed, badminton and Burley. Yeah, absolutely. Fingers crossed. So if we just move the conversation on to common mistakes and how to avoid them. And uh, Pip, you talked about um, doing hill work um, and d d there's quite a lot of misunderstanding about interval training and how people utilize interval training. What do you, what, what do you think are the top, how valuable is interval training and how would you use it? Well, I think I think with interval training, I mean, I do use it, but I vary. I'm a real one for varying my fitness programs, you know, like with people, like athletes. And I think you see it more in racing now too, with the racehorses, that it's not just about sprinting up a gallop. And so I do still use interval training. I think where people can go wrong is they can get they get advice and they get it into their head, right? They've got to go out and do three lots of five minutes with two minute interval. Um, I think, it's a, I think it's a definite thing where you need to build up with the interval training. I know myself with doing the running. I mean, I'm still not proud that I, I don't run very far, but, but I still do it in an interval training way. And it's the same with the horses. It's a slow, a slow build up. I think you have to take into account, again, the facility and the surfaces you, you use for it. Um, and I think it's really important when you do interval training, you actually don't just look at your watch, you actually really get into a habit of, of feeling how the horse is, how quick its recovery is. And I would always say, go on the softer side and slowly build up. And, you know, if you know your horse well, you, you should be able to tell whether, you know, it, it's actually, it found that really easy. So next time I'm gonna ask a little bit more. Um, I personally, I mean, I, Again, I'm very lucky because where I do some of the interval training is, is um, okay, not at the moment because the fields are too wet, but I, I can get into some lovely fields with quite, quite testing terrain. But I think that is, is wonderful for event horses because, and riders, because I don't, you know, I think it's, it's a real key thing that I, I'm, you know, if you can, I love getting on the different surfaces for horses and different cambers because the sport is about that. You know, one minute you're on sand, the next minute you might be in muddy conditions. It's not about just being on a perfect pristine gallop. So I, that's where I do my interval training. And again, the speed is related to the surface or the conditions. So, and or the terrain, if it's downhill, I'm not gonna go fast down the hill when I'm interval training, I'll go really, 
collected downhill, I might move them on up the hill. And a lot of it is about feel and, and people learning to feel how their horses, you know, do they feel good? Actually, that wasn't a hard workout next time. I'm going to just ask them a little bit more. Brilliant. Thank you. Now, uh, we've got about over 100 questions already. So I'm just going to ask people, by all means, add extra questions. But if you could have a quick scan of the current questions if you're on zoom um, and just you could there's an opportunity to vote up other questions so if it's a question that you would have asked uh, but someone has already asked it if you could upvote it then it comes to the top of the list and we'll be able to get through more of them um mark thinking about obviously um over facing a horse and rider competition uh, combination is is can be a problem what what do you look for about when to know that a horse and rider combination is ready to move up a level um, I think you know when when a horse and rider. I mean, if if we're if we're sort of talking, you know, novice horses and novice riders, um, you know, the it, it depends on on how brave the horse is, and it depends a little bit on how brave the rider is. But as a combination, you need to be going confidently and clear round the level that you're at before you're ready to step up. You know, sometimes, you know, people get a little bit carried away. You know, they might scrape around and 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 just get around across country in some sort of fashion, but really lucky. And oh, I did that clear, um, but really it was you know by the skin of their teeth, and and then they sort of jump up a level. You've got to be, as a combination, going confidently at the level that you're at before you're prepared to go up. Um, I think most most people are fairly sensible and, and conservative in that respect, but you do get um, the odd ones that, and I have actually on the odd occasion seen some people are riding at a low level in cross country and riding what I considered dangerously, and it, and it actually scares me a little bit watching some of it, and gone up and had a word with them and, and said, you know, look, you're going too fast, or or you need to go and school a bit more, and I think. I actually think in, in, you know, in, within the sport, there's room for, for something like that to help and advise some people. Because I mean, some people I don't think have any clue about, you know, how well they are going round across country or whether they have done it well or not. And, and I think not, not to do it in a critical way, but in an advisory way to help people. Um, Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Pip, you obviously, with, with the Billy Stud, and, and you bring on a lot of your own horses. Um, what, what mistakes do, do you think it's so important to avoid when preparing a young horse for competition? Well, I think, I think the key thing is not to run before you can walk. And I think a lot of people, and I see it when I offer help or when we go cross country school and you see other people schooling I think so many people go wrong because if a horse is unsure they try and use speed to get over the question so I would never ever use speed and that that comes from our four-year-olds coming to their very first cross pole ridden you know they don't come uh, fast because the slower you come yes in front of the leg you know on that straight line and they you give them time to see what the question is so I want to you know when my horses my young horses first go cross country cross, cross country schooling they always have a an older horse to lead them into water for the first time um, and then it is a case yeah that horses learn to from correct training you know to stay in front of the leg but you don't need speed to get them there and if if you have a problem where a horse is a little bit unsure or maybe it jumps a bit too big into water because it's green it astounds me the amount of people that then might do it two or three times but I will actually keep repeating it until the horse is so comfortable with no pressure being able to work out its footwork and that is what you know, cross country is all about is about the you know confidence as as Toddy picked up, and and um, I don't know whether anyone read the one of the quotes that I used in Horse and Hound that that trust takes years to years to 
build seconds to break and forever to repair and and that's one of the key things i really believe in with our with our young horses with all horses that it's it's you know not trying to run before you can walk and 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 if you do run before you can walk and horses you know get over that ditch by speed rather than given time to look at it it will bite you in the butt later on when that ditch gets bigger yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the things that we always used to do with the young horses is never never jump a fence that you can't do from walk yeah at the beginning so they they don't learn you know if you know quite often they'll come and stop and have a look and that's that's just but you should be able to then from that standstill kick and make them step over it and go and I think so many people ask too big a question too soon. So the horse learns to stop and they stop because they don't understand or whatever. And then once they've learned to stop, it's very hard to get it out of them again. So our, our rule was always start off with over low fences, ditches or whatever, that if they did stop and have a look that you could kick and make them step over from a standstill. And they learn then to go forward. So turning that on its head then, um, Mark, I mean, how do we promote longevity in event horses? I mean, it's obviously, I guess, a lot of incorporating what was already said, but are, are there any sort of thoughts or tips you'd have around, you know, trying to promote longevity? Well, I mean, if, if you're talking sort of international horses, I mean, the, I think the biggest thing is the surfaces that you work on, because, you know, to get horses fit and keep them fit over the years, um, at top level, they need to do a lot of work. And if you're working on bad surfaces, unlevel ground, ground that's too hard or, or shifty ground that, that's hard one minute and soft the next, you will get injuries and it's very hard to keep them sound. So having a good surface for those horses is very, very important, whether it be the arena that you ride in every day, the gallops that you use, or, where, or even where you go hacking. You know? I, I never go trotting over rough or unlevel ground because it's so easy for a horse to, you know, turn a joint or whatever. Um, but, you know, if, if you're at the sort of the, the lower end of the scale and, and, and starting off, you, you don't always have access, as we've already said, to working on good surfaces. So you've got to be very careful about the amount of work that you do because it's very easy to, to overdo it on bad ground and then you end up with... Um, lameness issues but for me having the horse fit to do um the job that you're asking it to do that's the most important thing if, if you're going to a big competition the horse is not fit you're way more likely to injure it or have it have a, an injury of some description so fitness is very important and again as i've said the surfaces that you work on and Pip, just picking up on that, I mean, if what are some of the signs that if, if a horse and rider combination is not fit enough, what, what, what are those signs that, that, that people should be looking out for? Well, going back on the longevity, I think, um, I think it's really important that, that um, riders, I know this makes, the, it, it sounds common sense, but it's amazing actually how few people don't do it, but I think it's really important to really know your individual horse and, and, and everyone automatically says they know it, but actually when I say know it, that you see how well they trot up, you see how they trot loose on a lunge, on the hard, on the soft, so you have a, a, a base to start from, do you know what I mean? So then, because often people miss the early, early signs of things, um, you know, very often some injuries that happen are because people have ignored the early signs and so I think when you really know that then it's it's a it you can prevent these things from happening and 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 it's so important to to know is that tiny bit of filling because it's had a little tiny boot rub or is that the start of something more serious and that's where people have actually as much as they really want to go to that competition actually they've really got to think that could be something more sinister and that's when you can get serious issues so it's really knowing your horse so you work on a preventative situation and that doesn't mean to say you need a vet in or you need a physio but it's actually knowing your horses yourself it's easy enough to stick them on a lunch you know and, or just put them on a, a circle on the hut just to see what they're like 
Um, sorry, I've gone off now, waffling. <laughs> No, 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 absolutely. That's great. That's great. I mean, I think you know, that, that, that thorough understanding is, is what yeah. underpins everything we talked about, especially when it comes to longevity and and making sure that we avoid those pitfalls. Yeah. And the other the other thing, again, what I would just quickly stress when again, we go back to the rider fitness of the rider and the straightness of the rider and being better balanced as a rider. It is. Time and time again, I think a lot of horses soundness issues can come because the rider's ridden crooked for several years, the horse has gone crooked for as many years, so then when a horse doesn't go straight, it then will overload, and it doesn't load equally, so that's where right from the management keeping your horses sound comes from that basic work of straightness, rider being in balance, riding it straight, so the horse is pushing equally. And, and, and a bit unrelated, but also relevant is, you know, on some of the teaching clinics I've done over the years, the amount of bad fitting saddles that you see, saddles that press down on horses' backs, and then, you know, they wonder why they can't move on the flat or jump. You know, not everybody can afford to have a, a, a well-fitting saddle for every horse, but you know, with with um, numbness and 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 things you can put under the saddle, at least you can make it so that it's comfortable to be on the horse's back. And that's one of my biggest bugbears. So, what I was going to say, you're better off to improve your balance by riding without a saddle at all and going back. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But I mean, but the science fun. supports that, doesn't it? I mean, actually, saddle fit is such an important part of of the of that combination. And 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 you were talking earlier about but different weights and different people riding, but riding light, and it's almost impossible to ride light in an ill-fitting saddle, isn't it? Yes, and the other thing also is I am aware that horses can change shape too over the course of a season so the saddle can fit at one stage and be a bit different later on when the horse is, is fit especially higher up the level when when horses can sh change shape so you know you, yes it's worth seeking advice but you know there are so many different pads and things out there and things that you could do to make it more comfortable for the horse but also it's also important that you have a saddle that suits you you see i see a saddles that you can just see sitting on a horse when people come for lessons and you can see the way the saddle is where the rider will sit it will throw the rider backwards so you yes you've got to have a yeah. good fitting saddle but also one where the rider can yeah absolutely it's a, it's a real telltale tell tell sign when you when you're on a clinic and you say hey, let me have a sit on that horse and you get in the saddle and you think oh my god how, <laughs> how do you ride in this <laughs> so so that, that's a lovely segue into because obviously having a, a a decent fitting saddle is a, is a really important part to protect and support um equine welfare and and obviously um since the, the, the two of you started eventing there's been a sort of a, a a transition in thought around the importance of good equine welfare so um mark what do you think constitutes good equine welfare in sport um you know, we're, we're very fortunate in having these animals as our partner in sport. So I think it's our responsibility to look after them in the, in the best way that we can. Um, you know, of, you know in, in eventing particularly, you know, it's, it's a, it is a tough sport and it can be tough on the horses. So all the things we said, you, ha you have to have them fit to do the job, which I think is the most important thing. Um, so it means fed well, looked after well, good veterinary care. And, and you know, it's not having the vet in, it, in every day. It's about what Pippa said, knowing your horse, checking your horse every day. You trot them up after a competition. Is it sound? Is it a bit sore here? So looking after it. We have, we have physios that come in to do the horses. We have back people. We have, you know, they are, for us, they are the athletes. You know, we also have to be an athlete too, but they are the athletes that have to do most of the work. So they've got to be treated like um, top class athletes. And that's the only way you get longevity out of it. It's the only way to be fair to the horse. Um, and I think, and therefore that, that is good welfare for the horse. 
Brilliant. And Pip, when we think about what you know, definition of good equine welfare, Mark's touched on the, the physical welfare, good health care and, and such like for, for our horses. But there's also a great understanding about the importance of mental well-being um, and actually giving our horses, you know, getting them to feel good so they, they, they live a, a truly good life. How, how, how do you achieve that with your horses? Um, well, I mean... I'm the biggest advocate. I mean, I'm as soft as hell with my with my horses. I don't think anyone who knows me knows exactly what I am like with my horses. I mean, absolutely. You know, this is a sport. It's a business to us all. But for me, absolutely, they are not tools for our trade. To me, whatever horse I work with, I want it to be one of my best buddies. And I think... Um, I mean, listen, it's a, it's a subject I could go, go on for hours over, but um, I think there needs to be better horsemanship as in all round horsemanship, the, that whole climbing into a horse's mind and thinking how each individual horse ticks. And I can tell you now, I could walk past any of my stables, any of my horses, and there's something in me. I... I won't even stop, but I will notice if that horse is just a little bit off colour or just looks a little bit down in himself um, for whatever reason, whether maybe the drinker stopped working. I would notice that, you know, without even looking at the drinker. But um, so I think it, it, it is really knowing, knowing your horse. But how do you make horses happy? To me... I think it's about being consistent with them, that they understand um, the rules. I think a happy horse is a horse that, that is happy in his work and being happy in his work, again, that comes to training the whole handling. You know, horses need to know, they get security to know where they stand. So I don't think horses are happy that are spoilt horses that barge over you aren't happy horses. I think my ha horses are happy because when they move, when I'm washing them off or if they start fidgeting, I tell them to stand still with my voice. Or if it's not the voice, I might just with a quick little on the lead rope. And as soon as they do, they get the reward. So I think by being consistent and black and white with them and then reward yeah, is key. And, and I would say, I mean, you can you could I would anyone could come around my yard and they can tell and you people can you can tell how horses are treated and whether they're happy or not and, and to me a horse that that um you know has built up that trust and you build up that trust with them I think I think that develops that sort of partnership and the happiness and the welfare issue and I and and I know you get a lot of people saying oh horses are cooped up 23 hours a day and they never get you know some don't get turned out I can say I'd love my horses to get turned out every day but actually the conditions of our fields at the moment they're not turned out at all but no they're not jumping out leaping out of their skins because they still have the work that is needed um, and they're stable but also they're kept interested I think because of the chit chat we all give the horses <laughs> we're always giving them lots of attention yeah well that, that social interaction is, is so important yes. and yeah yes. absolutely and we're understanding more and more what you've touched on there Pip is that how horses learn and actually that positive reinforcement that you, you, you were just mentioning there is, is so important in terms of getting them to, to learn and that consistency. To turn to a, a, a few more specifics, Mark, I mean, the, 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 the FEI is, it's known as the blood rule, it shouldn't be, but it is. Um, what, what, what do you think of the current approach to, um, to, to in, international competition around blood? Visible? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm... I've been out of it now for nearly two years, but um, it's 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 a it's a tough one. Nobody wants to see a horse bleeding from the mouth, but then you know there have been cases where you know a horse can easily bite its tongue or whatever, and it's it's not because it's being abused or anything. It's it's a bit like us, you know, bite your mouth the wrong way, and you can bite your tongue, and you've got you've got blood in your mouth, and and to be eliminated for that is is pretty tough. So I'm, 
to be honest, I don't know, Pip can probably answer this better than me. I don't know where the FEI stand at the moment, but um, you know, I think we've probably seen it more in dressage where, where you know, people have been stopped in the middle of their test at Grand Prix level because the horses have got blood in their mouth. I don't know. It's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a hard one. But obviously, if somebody's got a savage bit in the mouth and they're abusing a horse's mouth and it's got blood out of it, by all means, stop them, chuck them out. And you know, yeah. it's just not on. Pip, what's your, your take? Well, I think, I think there needs to be, yeah, I mean, a common sense approach about it. Absolutely. I think if, it's, if there's any human abuse involved, then absolutely the big E needs to come up. But I think there have been, we've seen on several situations, even with the, the spur rule, um, I've known it happen. And I know there was an incident at Olympia one year and, you know, the, the collecting rings are seriously, they're all stewarded. Um, so, you know, you can see no foul plays going on there or no abuse is going on there. And then uh, the question at, at Olympia, the guy jumped a lovely round and in front of a panel of judges and a massive audience. And when he came out, there was a tiny little nick from a spur. You could clearly see that there was no abuse involved. Um, and horses, I've had it, horses, some horses have very thin skin, but I absolutely agree that if if someone has been abusive, yeah. I'd do more than just eliminate them. I would, <laughs> um, but but I do think I think the, the the common sense approach, and I think on the whole, the ground juries, particularly in eventing, because let's face it, a horse could easily over each eventing or, you know, and the rider is completely unaware or it might have caught a, a stifle jumping into water and it, the rider is completely unaware that there might be blood on it. And I think they do on the whole take a pretty common approach and um, common sense approach. And I, often we've seen horses have been pulled up in that sort of incident, checked over and then they continue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, Pip, nosebands has been a big focus. There's been a lot of work around nosebands and nosebands tightness specifically. And the International Society for Equitation Science recommends you should be able to fit two fingers, regardless of what type of noseband a horse is wearing, that you should be able to fit two fingers between the noseband and the front of the horse's nose. Um, as I say, whatever type is using. What, what is your view about noseband tightness and the impact that has on equine welfare? Um, I think two fingers up to the people that don't fit two fingers. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's, to me, it's bad training. For if people are cranking up their nosebands that tight, then it's, it's yeah. I don't agree with it at all. I think it, it it's bad training. But I, having said that, I will hold up my hand. And, and sometimes it makes me cross because I naturally would use, you know, I, I, I find myself using the flash noseband quite a lot. I am not ever one to crank up nosebands. And because of the girls and things, I don't, I know you get some nosebands that, that double back, which you can't, and I've never, ever had any of those because I don't want stuff if I'm away you know by mistake because those nosebands are, are easier to get tighter but I feel yeah they, it, there's, there's no need for it and on top of that while we're talking about tack one thing that people often maybe aren't aware of either which I am absolutely I would check the whole time is uh, how easily you can get your fingers underneath the headpiece yeah. because there have been incidents where there's so much pressure over the pole and, and that wouldn't be something that people are aware of or they check, but it is unbelievable. If someone, if the noseband's a little bit low and, and it's done up and then you think, oh, it's a bit low and, and you adjust it to put it up, suddenly there's all this pole pressure mm. on top. So I think it's worth, on top of checking your noseband, check your headpiece as well. There's not too much pressure um, that you can get your fingers under there too. That's so important because I've been talking about that. Uh, like, Sorry, Mark. You know, some. Uh, I think the the tightness of the noseband normally comes in. A lot of it is in the dressage, and I think maybe there needs to be a look at and judging dressage that horses will naturally 
move, open their mouth and close their mouth a little bit. And I think this is why a lot of people shut their horse's mouths is because if a judge sees the horse opening its mouth a little bit, then they get marked down for it. So, you know, maybe that needs to be, that needs to be looked at a bit too, that, you know, let a horse use its mouth a bit during the dressage test and not just have it clamped shut. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I mean, we've talked a lot, a bit about saddle fit, and you, Pip, you made a really good point there about you know bridle fit is as important, and it's it's really important people do check that, and it's not just the nose band. Um, Pip, maybe best one for you because obviously Mark's into the racing world now, but the FEI this year has has banned the trimming of whiskers in competition horses. I think from July. Um, what 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 are your what do you think about that? Well, I mean. I'm going to be completely honest here. I, I do not have a problem with it at all. And I probably agree with it, but I will hold up my hand and say my whiskers have been trimmed. And, well, you know, uh, uh, mine, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks, Doddy. Um, and yes, I mean, if there's that much proof, then I'm, I'm feeling incredibly guilty over all the years I've trimmed all my all the horse's whiskers. And yes, it is probably for cosmetics. But having said that, knowing my horses very well, I, I can't say that any of them have whacked their heads in the night because, you know, so I'm absolutely fine with it. And I think it's one of those things, if that is in the best interest of the horse, that's absolutely fine and my horses are all got hairy whiskers which is 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 fine and and I don't have a problem with the rule change and if it's for the horse's advantage then then great and I yes probably have done the wrong thing for the whole of my career. Toddy have you trimmed your whiskers? I mean our, our horses we used to trim all the whiskers always had done for years and I can honestly hand on heart say we've never had an issue with a horse in any way involving that. Right. And I just think there's a lot more pressing welfare issues than, than trimming horses' whiskers. Um, we don't do it with the racehorses now because it's, you know, it's not a, a showing competition or, or whatever. But, and I probably wouldn't do it with the event horses either, but... In my experience over all the years, as I said, I've never known a horse with trimmed whiskers, you know, have a problem. You know, it's not as if they're, they're out in the wild trying to fend for themselves or anything. They're, they're in, a, in a safe environment. So I don't know, but I'm much like Pip. If, if I was doing it, you know, I, I'd be fine with it. But um, yeah, I, I, mean, I think there's, there's bigger issues. Quite possibly. I mean, I suppose it, it, it's just where, and, and to come back on your point, Pip, I, I mean, I, you, we shouldn't beat ourselves up on what we've done in the past about things we didn't know about. It's where you, when there's a greater understanding, then that's, you know, you look forward, you don't look back. Um, and, but, you know, it, it's obviously created a lot of um, interest. So, now, that's sort of done what we, um, we talked about before. There are 158 questions waiting to be answered. So I hope you're here till a midnight gone three weeks time because it might, we, we, we'll get through as many as we can over the next 20 minutes or so. Um, you said, can I have a sip of wine? Of course you can. And, and Mark, I know you were getting quite low. So do, um, do, do, do go and get yourself a top up if you need. I um, the you, bottom, you, you know, I came <laughs> <on the bed. laughs> So Yasella has asked, what do you do the week before a competition? Um, well, Pip, I'll come to you first. Um, I... She has another glass of <laughs> The Lord. Um, I mean, I always, uh, you know, ev again, it's knowing your horse. Every horse is different. So some horses, to me, I, I often find the day before a competition, they're better actually to work on a jumping saddle, do a bit more off their back and not drill them on the flat and, and make sure, particularly if they're horses that come out a bit bright, um, I would say usually the day before or two days before they will have a jump. Um, I'm not one, once the season's going, I don't jump them very regularly, but it, it, particularly if they're, they're good jumpers once the season's going, but I would normally give them a jump either the day before or two days before the competition. And they would do, um, I would do a serious piece of flat work again, either the day before or two days before again. So, but that, that whole week and, and fast work, I would probably do 
three days before we're talking advanced horses three or four days before um and again it depends what when they're talking about a normal competition just as in a, a national one or a, a big three day obviously a big three day is very different because i would always try with the three day actually to slightly back off running up to the last week i would give them a slightly easier week um running into a big three day event okay um, thank you, Pip. And then to reflect that to the other side, Mark, what, so someone's asked, what are your five top tips? But I mean, g g give us uh, any number. Uh, can I, I'm sure Pip will chime in for the care of the horse after a competition. Um, well, I mean, the first thing after 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 it's run cross country, if it's hot, you, you wash them down, you get them cooled down, um, you check for any... Um, any nicks or cuts or, or injuries on the horse. Um, if there's nothing there, then you don't have to, to worry. If there is, then obviously you have to deal with those. Um, <clears throat> normally we would give the horse time to cool out after it's run cross country and then trot it up to make sure that it's sound. Uh, and again, you know, if, if it's not, then you have to address that and find out what the problem is. Um, we always, we always used to um, put some sort of poultice on the horse's legs um, at night. Um, there is some talk and well, some uh, in some quarters believe that that's a total waste of time. Um, I don't know. Um, we probably did it in any way out of habit and, and I, think, I think it can have um, a good effect. Um, you can also put cooling gels on the horse's legs. Um, the horse, uh, you know, if it's at a competition, it's got a um, show jump the next day. If it's a three day, you might have a massage or something like that. Um, you've got to make sure the horse is thoroughly hydrated, um, which is really important. Um, and I think, you know, leading up to the leading up to the competition during the competition, it's really important that the horse has access to fresh good quality water all through the competition i hate seeing horses that um, aren't allowed to drink water um and basically just uh, you know making sure that they're happy and, and comfortable and um whatever afterwards well you've done more plenty more than five there so that, that's um, that's great thanks Mark. um jane's asked Pip, um how would you prepare a more chunky type horse with the ability to be able to compete at a higher level um, uh, I mean, again, I think it's, you know, I think one thing that I hate to see, and I, I, I think I've seen it a few times in the past, is when don't try and think, because it's chunky, that you then think by getting it really skinny um, and not feeding it properly, it's going to make the horse look thinner um, and look more quality for sure if it is depends if it's chunky or if it's actually too fat because that's two different things because if you've got a horse that's chunky that isn't isn't fat you know then there's no point in starving it to try and turn it into a thoroughbred it's never going to be a thoroughbred so you've got to understand that and 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 it's finding ways and again it's about it's about the, the fitness side and the fitness program so probably that that chunkier horse is actually going to need a little bit more work than some. I mean, you know, a thoroughbred won't need to necessarily gallop as much as, uh, you know, a, a chunky one. I'm not saying gallop, that's the wrong word, but a chunky one would, maybe you, you would want to do a bit more canter work. It doesn't mean fast, but a little bit more to help it. And yes, if you've got access to hills, for sure. And I think also it's about, yes, moving it up, but it's, it's also about planning courses for horses you know if you're if you're go talking about higher up you know if, if you've got one if I have one that maybe potentially might lack I think a bit of quality I'm not going to take it to Burley for instance you know if you really think even at that level Burley is a, a real stamina test for horses and to me you know you don't want to be taking a horse at that level that's chunky um necessary to Burley because that is going to hit it far harder than a flatter course so I think it's choosing okay that's 
the top end of the sport, but it's still choosing courses for your horse and then trying to, to yeah, improve the, the fitness to help you. Brilliant. Thanks, Pip. Um, Mark, I, I, I'm not sure what the answer to Samantha's question is going to be or whether you'll have one, but what would you say is the key ingredient in a good eventing horse? When you try a horse, what makes you go, yes, this is a good eventer? Well, you know, over the years, the, all the good ones I've, I've had all come in different shapes and sizes. But for me, still one of the, the, the first things you notice is the horse that has a good head and a, and a good eye. I love a horse with a good, big, generous eye um, and a good outlook on the world. Um, then, of course, you've got to look at how it's put together. I mean, you're never going to find the perfect horse. So, but, you know, there are, there are some confirmation defects that are, that are an absolute no-no. Um, and, and it's that indefinable, you know, is the horse an athlete? And... Um, and that's a very hard thing to 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 define, and it's and it's quite can be quite a hard thing to spot. And then, you know, if you're buying a buying a three year old or or or, or whatever, um, and you can't sit on it, it can be a bit harder. But you know, you look for a horse that uses his body in a good way, whether it's in the walk and trot or canter. Um, and I mean, I think that's probably without getting into too much deal, the most basic thing. I love a horse with a good head and a good eye and a horse that can use his body in a good way. Brilliant. And what you can't always see is the mind. Really <laughs> important. That takes time. And the heart. Um, so, so uh, someone's just actually asked, Ben's just asked, so what, what, why, why was Charisma such a good horse? Um, he, he, was, he was an absolute athlete um, and he loved his job and he was a showman. Um, he was very well put together. Um, he, was, he was a bit wee, wasn't he? He was quite sure. Was he was only 15 three. Um, I don't think he ever took a lame step in his life. Um, incredibly tough, um, but just a, a super athlete. Yeah. Uh, Pip, I could ask you about Supreme Rock and so many others, but I'm going to ask you, how do you build lunging into your fitness work? With the horses? Yeah. Well, there's lunging and there's lunging. <laughs> when I say that, yes. I mean, there's there's nothing worse than, uh, it drives me mad when, when people don't lunge sort of correctly and seeing horses spin around or falling in on the circle. You know, same thing. It, it's all about train, training them, you know, teaching them to lunge properly. I'm actually, which possibly shouldn't necessarily um, people shouldn't necessarily do because you need to have experience or be taught how to do it but I'm passionate about double double line you know so I I I love that because then I've got a second line behind them so like driving and then if I want to drive them a bit I'll go behind and I'll jog along behind them driving them and then I'll change the rain so um and I think with the double the with the second lunge rain behind them you've got more control but also it lifts it it has a wonderful way of sort of because you've got the lunge line behind the hind legs it helps them to just lift their tummy and engage their core because you know horses to me um it's the same with them you know for them to get supple their their tummies have to come up and their backs have to come up so i think there's huge benefit with i find with lunging but there isn't a huge benefit if they're being lunged badly and just hooning around falling in then it actually can really work the other way and and the same thing again with surfaces you know you've got to have a good surface to lunge on brilliant okay thank you both. mark N nadine's asked any tips for a horse who could be more courageous or they want to make more courageous or is that something that is not trainable <clears throat> um, it can be trainable. Um, I think the key with a horse that's not too courageous is not to overface it. And, and, and you have to be really positive and strong as a rider to help give the horse confidence. And I think, uh, you know, if, if it's not courageous cross country, it's, it's like, you know, as we've said in the um, earlier you know don't jump things that are too big that are that are going to frighten it um but yes you have to be very positive 
Uh, if you're sitting there going, oh, I'm not sure whether I want to jump this or not, the horse is probably going to say, no, well, I'm not sure either, so let's not. Um, so it's about being positive, having the horse in front of the leg, and maybe even reinforcing the leg with a bit of stick on takeoff so that the horse understands. And, and if he then learns to, that he has to go forward at a fence, you can help um, make the horse a little bit braver. Brilliant. Thank you, um, Mark. Pip, um, Jenna's asked, was having a, Dave, Dave got a 20 by 40 arena, uh, but only a small amount of lane hacking. What can they do around interval training in the school? Well, I still think you can, even in a 20 by 40, you know, you can still vary the pace. And, and again, for rider fitness, jock up your stirrups, stick them right up. And be out of the saddle, off the off 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 the horse's back, um, and move them on slightly up the short, so up the long side, you know. And you can change your balance as if you can, you as if you're imagining you're going cross country in that position. And then before the short side, you could bring your body up, close them up, move them on again. So you can you can still change your rein and keep it keep it all balanced. And 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 I I sometimes sort of put have things in the school that you sort of almost imagine that's like going around trees or something you know so you you're just all the time but in a cross-country type position so you've got shorts you know your shorter stirrups and and again changing changing gears and yeah. keep having on those lanes too yeah 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 um <laughs> and John, sorry and the other thing too that can help um, refitness, um, which I've done too, and I, I've been doing it a bit now because I, I well, I've now been to some counties a couple of times, but but you could build, you needn't go big at all, but put some, some little fences up and just keep incorporating little jumps as you're doing your interval training, have some little jumps as well. So you're sort of keeping, because that again is, is helping the fitness. Sure, brilliant. Thank you. Um, Mark, how often did you do you jump your horses during the on and off season? Um, well, it, it depended a bit on the horse. Um, you know, as, as Pip said earlier, you know, as preparation leading up to the first competition, you know, they'd probably jump once, twice a week. Um, and again, depending on the horse. Um, once the horse is in competition, if he was a good jumper, you wouldn't jump them that much at home. Um, I never used to jump big at home a lot. You know, it was more sort of just sort of suppling, schooling exercises. Occasionally you have to jump some bigger fences um, to get them used to it. But once the horse knows its job um, and is at a, at a higher level, they don't need a lot of jumping, I don't think. Brilliant, thank you. Pip, what's your view about steady trotting on the roads and lanes? Is it bad for the joints or is steady okay? Um, well, I know um, different people have different opinions, um, and I'm sure the vets say, possibly a lot of vets might say not to, but I have to say throughout my career, I've always trotted on the roads. Yes, I haven't trotted fast on the roads, but I've always trotted particularly uphill, slowly uphill, and with the horses in a, in a shape and a frame, and and... I always used to joke because William Fox but never used to trot on the roads and 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 in the old days I always used to say well why don't you trot on the roads when you have to trot around these stony old roads and tracks and things um and so so different people you know he hasn't he I think he does now but I've I've always done it and and I think I probably have always done it because it goes back to the fact that you know as a kid I grew up very much hunting, uh, hunting. Um, you know, I, I I hunted with my with uh, the pony I rode, and and hunt, hunting people trot on the roads. And I, I could honestly say, I think all the years I've trotted on the road, I don't think any of the injuries I've had with horses are because I've trotted on the roads. Absolutely, thank you, Pip. Um, Mark, what is the one thing you would tell your younger self about competing? If you could reflect back to 1978, when I think it was at your first World Games in Kentucky, what 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 would you, what would you tell yourself? Oh God, that's a hard one. I don't Not know. have so many parties in the lorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, I honestly don't know. I don't know what I'd tell myself because I've, I've had, you know, such a fortunate um, time doing it and, and, and a great time doing it. Um, probably do it all over again. Yeah. Well, that, that's marvellous. And in a similar question, Sophie's asked, um, Pip, she, she's 10 years old and I, she would like to know how to start my eventing journey. You've got to keep following your dream. You've got to, you have got to work very, very, very hard. Um, yeah, I mean, never be afraid to ask for help. Get help, get advice. I think, I think you know, that is key. And, and I think watch a lot of people, watch people, learn, learn by watching other people. And um, yeah, the main thing is enjoy it. Love yeah. it. Love your pony. Look after your pony or your horse. Um, and hopefully you'll be as lucky as I've been. Well, and get your mother, get, yeah, get, get your parents to hopefully, um, yeah, look after you and, and just just um, warn them. Because I think my poor mother has gone through hell watching me eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, Mark, what... Obviously, especially with racing now, I mean, what, how would you alter your uh, fitness approach for your horse if it's had a tendon in injury, but it's been given the all clear to jump? How would you vary its fit, their fitness regime? Um, well, I think if, if it's been given the all clear um, and well, presumably then, um, you know, there's a fairly standard protocol with getting a horse back to, to fitness when, when if it's had a, um, um, a tendon injury and it, and it goes along the lines of what we've already talked about, slow, steady build up and gradually building up the amount of work and touching on what we were talking about just, or Pip was talking about earlier, road work. I think it's also very beneficial to do a certain amount, a small amount of trotting on a firm level surface that actually does toughen and harden the, the, the tendons and ligaments as well. Um, not pounding the roads forever, but um, a certain amount of it. Um, and then, you know, you're just gradually building up, schooling on the flat in the school, then start jumping small fences and, and just taking it gradually and, and gradually building up the amount of work. Thank you. So listen, I didn't warn you about this, but we've got so many questions. We're just going to we're going to wind up shortly, but we're going to do a bit of quick fire questions. So either yes or no answers or really short answers, if you could do that. And we'll just see how many we can get through. So Amy's asked, how do you keep your horse in a consistent winter routine without it becoming too repetitive, Pip? Well, oh, my God, that's not a quick answer. No, that um, isn't a quick answer. Well, I vary it. I mean... It, it's not just for the horses, really, it's for mine. It would drive me mad if I was doing the same thing every day. So I vary it every day from, you know, whether I do poles or different pole exercises. I use poles a lot. Um, or as I said, canter off the back a bit or just keep changing things. But also um, I vary, you know, what I go with a plan in my head, what I hope to work on on a daily basis basis and sometimes horses throw something else at you so you work on something else but you're never going to cover everything every time you sit on a horse so so have a bit of a plan in your head and keep Brilliant. it going. Mark Tara's asked how many times do you hack your horses per week compared to taking them in the school? Um, if I was on my eventing horses um, they would probably they used to hack probably most days they'd go out for a bit of a hack um, and then maybe come and have to do a bit in the school if I wanted to. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So, well, four, five days a week anyway. Um, Pip, <laughs> you're not getting any easy ones. Abigail's asked, what, what are your go-to exercises to do in the school to improve fitness? Um, the, the, uh, Abigail's lacking inspiration with her show jumper. Um, well, um... God, I mean, the internet is a wonderful, wonderful thing, and you can go, and even if you just t tap in pole work exercises, but maybe you haven't got lots of poles, but um, just, I would, I mean, there's so much on the internet you can get, but I, I would 
work a lot on yourself you know in count the i'd work if you're a show jumper i think you can play even if you haven't got poles play on counting how many strides you go from one end to the other and then see if you can do you know less strides there or more strides there pick points so even if you haven't got poles pick places to do things at so that i mean i just every day i mean i love just make yourself be disciplined because by making yourself pick points riding straight trot when you're meant to trot cat or pick a point to canter at you know so you're just very very self-disciplined brilliant um d d mark donna's asked from a mindset perspective do you have any tips on how to beat the nerves anxiety aspect of competing oh they didn't ask me that <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think first of all you know nerves and anxiety are all part and parcel of it you know you Everybody, everybody has them. So um, it's about being in control of your mind, not letting your mind run away with you. Um, and because your mind can play terrible tricks on you and start imagining all sorts of terrible things that, go, that can go wrong. And it's just tell your mind to shut up and just get on with it. Love it, love it. Um, Pip, when, when is it young a green? What, what are the signs for a young and green horse to be ready to go cross country for the first time? Well, I think I think when you you feel you're absolutely in control and they they know the basics at, at home. Or you know, I would never again when I said run before I can walk. I would and and same thing if if you're in a situation like I am, you can hack and find little things out hacking and things. Um, but yeah, don't suddenly go cross country for the first time if it's not capable of, you know, happily and confidently popping around a little course at home. Or you know, I think yeah, it needs to know the basic aids and you need to know you've got sort of full control brilliant thank you yeah. mark someone's asked what do you do with horses between three and five years old so once they've been uh, backed do you work them almost every day or less no um i, I presume we're not talking about race horses now <laughs> no <laughs> um I, I think i think you know with I just like breaking horses and the younger the better because the sooner they, they learn about discipline and, and what have you, the better. That's not to say that you put them into full work, but you know, break them in, get them handled, get them used to the boundaries or whatever, give them a break. And then, you know, they don't want to be in full work all the time, particularly you know, three and four year olds, but you know, bring them in, do six weeks work with them, put them out for a few weeks, bring them in again, do a bit more. Um, it, it's, it's a bit like having kids at school, you know, they need stuff to keep their mind occupied and to keep them busy. And, and, and that's, you know, the, the earlier they learn stuff, the easier it is for them. But we're putting too much pressure on them. Sure. Um, thank, we'll do a couple more questions then we'll wind it up. Pip, um, Fiona's asked, I've been going to the beach to do canter work. Is it better in or out of the water in your view? Well, I think the main thing with the beach, I think you have to be aware that that you, you're certainly not going too fast because as far as I'm aware when I the few times I've been on the beach I, I know that the going can suddenly change can't it you can be pretty firm and and that's always the slight worry I mean you know I don't know the beach that you go on but I think you have to just be a bit careful I think the one thing about the beach what's wonderful is if you're just walk walking in the sea I think that absolutely you know to it, walking and trotting in the sea i think there's no no nothing better than salt water for their legs um, but i would i would definitely be a bit cautious um doing fast work on the beach as in unless yeah. you know the going's okay can I, can yeah, I just quickly say because we, we used to train racehorses on the beach at home and you always used to do it as the tide went out not in the water but just on the on the water's edge and that way you know, the sand was very level and it was normally was a good level surface. Brilliant. But it's great, trot it's great trotting them in, in, you know, six and eight inches of water as well. Very good for their legs and good for their muscles. Excellent. Final question. Uh, it's a Facebook question from North Kent College students. Do you have complementary alternative therapy methods that you find useful for the maintenance of fit horses and for rehabilitation after injury? Mark? Well, well, my, my, my wife's a great one on alternative therapies, um, home, homeopathic remedies and all sorts of things. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of them are very good. 
I mean, you you still obviously need to to use a, a vet for um, for anything anything major, but physio, um, natural remedies are all very good for for useful tools to have in your in your stable. Brilliant, Pip. Any thoughts from you on that? Well, I'm uh, uh, I'm very hands on myself. I mean, I I myself, yeah, with all the horses, I always regularly am feeling over their backs and things, and I think I do a lot of stretching exercises with them. And and yes, I have a physio come in on a fair well once every couple of weeks. You know, with with our whole large operation, we do have a physio come in to check them. Um, you know, we've may use magnetic rugs and things in the past, but to be honest, on the whole, I think, you know, we closely monitor the horses. And as I say, I, I, I'm, I am hands on and it's amazing how you can just by stretching, they, you can just get rid of some of the spasm and things. But, you know, as I said, with our huge operation with all the Billy, Billy horses and everything, it, we have got to be fairly realistic. And if you're not careful, you could, everything can blow up out of, you know, if you start this, that, and the other. Well, one, one latest thing we've got is a, a salt therapy room for the horses, um, which, is, which is quite interesting. And then we've found it very good for um, clearing up skin problems on horses, um, coughs and colds and all that sort of thing. So, it's, okay. uh, so that's a room, do you say? A room, yes. We've made a special room and it's got this uh, um, machine that pumps um, medical grade salt and fine particles in there it's a bit like being a, at the beach on a windy day i was about to say you bring the beach to your home that's a, a fascinating um <laughs> we could go on I, I'm... <laughs> listen uh mark and, uh, and pippa thank you so much well th firstly thank you to everyone i'm i'm we've 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 tried to get through as many questions but i have to say it's it is looking up mount everest because there's still so many that aren't answered but i hope that's given you a, a flavor of how you can get your horses fit for uh for the coming season whatever that season may hold uh mark and 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 Pip, thank you so much. Just before we go, obviously we've um, we've talked a lot this evening about getting our horses fit and the considerations uh, that that involves. Uh, Mark, what would you be your final thoughts? What were the key to take home messages to people who are listening? Um, well, it's a bit well, what Pip said actually is you know learn to listen to your horse, um, and I think that's probably the, one of the key things is you know they can tell you so much about whether they're not feeling right or whether they're feeling really good and. Um, you know, so do do best by them, and and uh, you know they will do best by you. Wonderful words, Pip. Can you follow that? Yeah, no, I mean I would absolutely, <laughs> yes, exactly would agree with with Toddy on that completely. You know, it is it's it's um, sorry, I've lost I've, I've lost the plot now. <laughs> what was the, what was the question? <laughs> what was your know, what's your key take home messages? What's your key what's your key take home message? Well, I think yeah, um, I think from I think don't worry about things that you can't control. Work a lot on the things that you're capable of controlling. So, you know, absolutely keep working on yourself. Keep looking after your horses, um, and don't regret. It's too late after the competition. It's too late after something by saying, God, I wish I'd been fitter. I wish, you know, I wish I'd done this. I wish dot every I, cross every T so that you don't have any regrets afterwards. None of us can control what's going to happen, the rain or whatever. But yeah, control what you really can control. I love the horses. Wonderful. Sorry, um, I fell at the last. Sorry. No, no, you certainly didn't. You, you picked yourself up and you were great. And listen, both of you, thank you so much for giving out your time this evening. Um, your, the second webinar, I, I'm sure you'll enjoy the third one as much when you come back. But but thank you so much tonight. That's been brilliant. And there's just lo lovely comments coming in from, from, from everyone. So thank you to, to Mark and to Pip. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, if you've got thoughts on uh, future webinars, then please let us know by sending your thoughts through to Education at World Welfare 
Org. As I mentioned earlier, our next webinar is in a fortnight's time on equine first aid. Uh, so please do, there's a, there's a, um, a link there to sign up to that. Um, hopefully life is getting, the days are definitely getting longer. Spring is on its way. The winter, worst of the winter weather is behind us. So enjoy your horses. Thank you very much. Take great care of yourselves and we'll see you in a fortnight. <laughs>